Welcome to the Seattle Investors Club podcast with Julie Clark and Joe Bauer, where we share the nuts and bolts of real estate investing from our 20 plus years in the industry. Sit back, relax, listen, and immediately take action. Are you ready? Here we go. Welcome to the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing podcast. My name is Joe Bauer and I'm here with my co-host, Julie Clark. Julie, how are you doing today? I am all good in the hood, Joe. Just uh, three weeks, I say, maybe less before school starts so we can get back to a normal schedule. Oh. I, I think everybody always thinks that at the summertime for parents is like, you know, it's all great. It's, kids are out of school. It's so fun. But it's actually more expensive and more stressful because, <laughs> uh, you know, you got to make sure they have something to do. So, um uh, I'm looking forward to school getting started. I know some of the other people on our podcast today. I don't know, Nee, you might not be in that department yet, but um, trust me, uh, school year is better for managing your life. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing them go to school. Yes. Now, how old is your oldest now? Uh, two years and four months. Yep. You're, you got a ways to go. You got a ways to go, but it'll be fun, no doubt. So, Joe, where are you at today? I'm just in Anchorage again. Nothing super exciting this time, although we are bouncing uh, out to Juneau tomorrow. And then we'll go to from Juneau to, on a tour to Glacier Bay National Park, see some glaciers. Nice. What's, uh, what's the best thing that happened in the last week on your road trip? Um, so we went down to Kenai Fjords National Park, which is, you basically go to Seward, which is really beautiful down there. And then you take a, an eight hour tour on a boat out to, yeah, really long full day, um, where you go and you see glaciers and you see, like we saw orcas, we saw puffins, um, we just, a lot of really beautiful, um, nature. And things like that and it was cool because you go out to the glacier and we several times we saw like the ice cracking off the glacier into the water oh wow we, we lucked out and got a really clear day and it was like 75 it literally felt like and looked like you were in hawaii because there's a lot of really um really interesting mountains that actually look hawaii-ish around here so when the weather was that warm it felt tropical almost yeah, at a glacier though so really weird super awesome Jealous, no doubt about it. Absolutely jealous. Well, yeah, I'd like to get one more camping trip back in, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Well, how was your trip? Oh my God, it was so awesome. I, I'd like to all tell you about my secret spot in Salmon Lasac, but you might show up. And it wouldn't be a secret anymore. So for those of you, actually, I was thinking it'd be fun to get like a investor's camping trip together where a bunch of us go for a weekend and camp. That would be super fun. So Heck yeah. But anybody that thinks that's a good idea, maybe maybe next year we'll go for that. But um, other than that, um, I want to thank Aaron Royce, who's going to be our guest today on the podcast. Um, you know, this is our new podcast series called My First Three Deals. And I have my co-host, my lovely, I'll use the word lovely co-host, Neely. Um, hey, Neely, what's going down? Good morning. That's the first time that adjective has been used on me. What's that? What what adjective is? Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh well, I'm gonna. I'll start thinking of some good ones for you. You <laughs> calls me lovely all the time, so I just stole that one. From you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this podcast again is called My First Three Deals. It's a series that we kicked off in partnership with Certain Lending, who is our sponsor for this podcast today. Um, and the goal here is that Nee and I are going to talk to real estate investors. Um, who will share their personal experiences on their first few deals, because um, we all know that is a fantastic way to learn from others and support each other um, as we all navigate the ups and downs of our crazy real estate business. So also, if any of you guys out there listening are willing to share your story with us of your first three deals, um, you know, uh, shoot me an email at julie at seattleinvestorsclub.com because we would love to hear from you. We're always looking for new guests on this podcast series. Um, and so just one other admin thing, I want to make sure you guys know how thankful and happy we are to have certain lending as our Seattle Investors Club preferred lender. And I, as I said, the sponsor of this new podcast series, 
Um, I think a lot of you have been out there uh, in the real estate investing business for a while. No, there are uh, quite a few hard money lenders out there and you need to choose your lending partner very, very wisely. And that is exactly what we have done here at Seattle Investors Club. Um, I like to say there is a reason that the word certain is in their name and you can find out for yourself by giving them a call on your next deal. Um, I think Joe will have in the show notes uh, later today the information about how to contact certain lending and how to contact me directly um, at the bottom of our show notes. So with that said, let's kick it off and introduce Aaron Royce of Think3RE. He's a local investor and certainly an action taker. That's why we love Aaron. He's done five or six flips. He's in the middle of uh, the sixth fifth flip right now uh, to date and has also been able to start buying rentals out of state. Um, he's a family guy with two boys and his wife Emily is also involved in their real estate investing business. So that's always cool if you guys are looking for other family businesses to connect with to see how they roll. Aaron would be a good guy to talk to. Um, and I, most importantly, have very much enjoyed getting to know Aaron this year um, as he joins us weekly at our Seattle Investors Club meetup. And thank you, Aaron, for taking the time today to share your story with us. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on. This is really exciting. It is exciting because I'm every time we do this, we have some sort of great nuggets come out of this, right? Even if people have been doing this forever, it's great to hear, you know, the experiences of people that when they start out um, is always a great reminder. And I feel like they are almost sometimes the best people to learn from because they are, you know, fresh off uh, having those experiences um, as we roll through our businesses today. So Joe, kick us off with the the starter question, and, and um, we'll let Aaron tell us his story today. Yeah, Aaron. So the first question is always to get to know you a little bit better. So we'd love for you to go back in time and tell us how you grew up, where you grew up, and how that led you into real estate. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, so I grew up in uh, Santa Monica, California. I was a beach kid. Um, used to cost 10 cents to go from my house down to the beach every day in the summer. Um, that was really cool. Um, and grew up living in apartments, really. Um, I was with a single mom and I was an only child. And honestly, we didn't have much. Um, and, uh, you know, I just kind of grew up in that environment. And then um, when things started uh, picking up for my mom in terms of work, she moved us out to the San Fernando Valley of California. And, um, you know, in that area, did kind of my, my middle school and my high school. And during that time, my mom actually bought her first condo. And that was like the first property that she owned. And the thing that I remember growing up was that she was always terrified of losing it. And, you know, being a single mom, you know, just making that payment was like her biggest thing. And, and anytime she, you know, had to change jobs or lost a job, you know, honestly, you know, she just would freak out about losing this condo. And so honestly, growing up, I thought owning real estate was actually a negative. And so, you know, I went off to college at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California, gorgeous area, got a job out of school, made great money. And here I was living in Southern California as a single guy, renting a room in somebody else's house. So I was, you know, saving a lot of my money. And yet, I didn't want to buy any real estate because honestly, to me, again, again, it had that negative connotation. So it wasn't till um, later on that um, I'd been working for almost eight or nine years and I finally met my soon to be wife. Um, she, she worked for a company that was a vendor of ours. And so I had to go over there and do audits and things like that <laughs> with them <laughs> and uh, thought, thought she was pretty cute. Um, and uh, we got together and uh, I was actually leaving my job to go into full-time Christian ministry overseas. And it was just one of those things that, you know, she had a very similar interests, had actually studied that stuff in school. And so when we started dating, you know, I realized that, hey, she's, she wants to go on adventures with me. So uh, we went off and did that. And it was, what was really interesting is we did that for almost five years. And somewhere in the middle, I remember we were home 
um, for, uh, you know, trying to raise money just so we could stay out, you know, and keep doing what we were doing. Cause you know, we were kind of fulfilling kind of our passion at the time. And, and when I was home, I was visiting a really good friend of mine who I'd gone to school with and he was an engineer like I was. And, um, he had quit his engineering job and started teaching, took a huge pay cut, but it was what he wanted to do. And he was telling us that the reason he was able to do that is because he had bought a 10 unit apartment complex, had split it into a six unit and a four unit, sold off the four unit, was still, and then finally, you know, fixed up the six unit and then sold that. And he had made so much money that he was able to pick a career that he actually had a passion around as opposed to just doing something that paid well. And all of a sudden, you know, the lights started going on. I'm like, well, how did you do that? And he introduced me to the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and, um, and then encouraged me to play the Rich Dad, Poor Dad board game called Cash Flow. And so we got a hold of the game and, and got a hold of the book. And, and then my dad was like, at the same time, had just started playing the game as well. And so we visited with my dad on one of these trips home and we started talking about real estate and, and all of a sudden just the, the, um, the gear started turning and my, my mind started shifting because now I started understanding that, you know, real estate is an asset that actually helps you build wealth, like long-term wealth. And, and it was the first time I'd ever thought about that. So I was already almost in my thirties. I think my, I was like 30, 31, uh, before I'd ever kind of shifted towards that. And so what we did is we took that information and, and we were living in South Africa at the time. Sorry, I didn't mention that. That's where we were doing our ministry. And um, we needed a place to live and we started looking at places to rent. And then we realized that land and, and property was so cheap there. We maybe should buy something because, you know, the, the exchange rate was so good. So we ended up uh, on recommendation of a, a friend from church who was a real estate agent and a developer he said, look, there's this awesome piece of land. Um, you should uh, really check it out and build on it because it can be done very cheaply. But if you don't buy it, I'm going to buy it. <laughs> so, you know, having read the book, our mindset was in, you know, was in the right place. And we thought, oh, well, let's give this a try. And we ended up building a house that had a permanent view of the ocean from our bed. Didn't even have to lift our heads off the pillow to see the waves breaking. Um, and, and, you know, we enjoyed that. But then when we decided to come home, uh, the asset had had a, had appreciated. The exchange rate was in our favor, and we ended up making pretty good money on that property. And that was like, you know, the first time we had done that. And so when we came home, we thought we should really figure out how to do this on purpose instead of just kind of like, you know, stumbling across it. So that's kind of how we got into real estate. And then when we we did come back in 2005 to the states, we moved to Washington because my wife's sister lived up here. And my wife wanted to live near her. I figured, hey, I dragged you to Africa. You can drag me to Washington. <laughs> um, and that's how we settled here. And, and, and while I was working uh, at a job, we were also trying to learn the real estate thing. And we kind of got caught up in the, the downturn of 2008. We lost pretty much everything we had tried to build. And then we were out of the game for almost eight years. And we didn't get back in until 2017. And that... Um, in 2017 is when we flipped our first property. So everything we had done previously was, um, you know, we had tried to buy some rentals because we had some money that we made on that one house that we had sold. And then we were trying to wholesale and we, you know, we were just really scrambling quite a bit, but our first flip was, wasn't until 2017. And that's, that's kind of when we really decided, Hey, let's, let's give this a shot. And we started moving forward from there. Wow. So what, how did you end up, uh, what caused it if you, the, losing everything related to real estate or was that related to other stuff or did you have a bad real estate experience during the downturn? Yeah. You know, honestly, I chalk that up to, you know, we made a chunk of money on this house, right. And we had read a book and we'd played a board game and we had talked to a few people. We thought we were all that in a bag of chips, honestly. <laughs> so we came back and just started buying property at the top of the market. Um, you know, we really wanted to put into action. I mean, the good part of it is we were trying to put into action what we had learned, right? We wanted to buy assets that cash flowed, but unfortunately we just tried to do too much too fast. We tried to buy a few properties out of state. We, um, uh, even tried to go in on a land development deal in Tequila here locally. And it was all just at the worst time possible. And then of course we, we, learned some valuable lessons on that too, in terms of trying to develop a property without really understanding the process. 
And then just as the market started turning, my, uh, my father, who was my partner on that development deal, he just said, we cannot put another cent into this deal and we're out. And then all of a sudden just it started crumbling from there. And then because we had bought the rentals at the highest part of the market, as that started downturning, they were never really cash flowing. They were kind of maybe breaking even. Um, but then we kept having these repairs that had to be done. And we just, we honestly couldn't afford it. And I also went uh, in 2010, um, we had leveraged ourselves so much because I was trying to do it full time at that time as well. I'd quit a job and then, um, you know, was trying to do it full time that we were living off credit and just making all kinds of mistakes. And we just built up this huge uh, debt um, and it just all collapsed. And so we, we actually went through bankruptcy at the time and we lost several properties that we owned. Um, and, you know, the, the Tequila deal crumbled and it just, it put us out of the game. And it's just because I think we went way too fast, just tried too many things and just got way over our head without really good advisors around us and, and, you know, just taking it kind of carefully and building momentum. And that's what we changed in 2017 is we said, we're going to analyze every single deal and just make sure one, it makes sense two that it makes money. And then we'll focus on the next one. We know we've been successful. And so we started really slowly this, this last time around. So where did you, uh, you know, once you, you read the book, played the board game, all that stuff, but when you, when you started back up again, when you took the plunge again and good for you for not quitting, right? Yeah. Because things are going better for you now. Where did you start learning or, or, you know, learning how to actually crunch the numbers better? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, beyond just the book there, is there some, you know, education or coaching that you were getting? Absolutely. That to give you that confidence to move forward? Yeah, absolutely. So again, kind of back to the 2005 to 2008 timeframe, um, we did get involved with a real estate investing education company. Um, we spent about $20,000 to get ourselves educated. Um, and again, I, I, the education was phenomenal. I mean, it was very sound, but we, again, we, we studied everything. We like studied all these different techniques and instead of just picking one to get really good at, we were just like, well, let's try this. And, oh, okay, now let's try this. And, and, and so we spread ourselves so thinly. But the education stayed with us. I still have a whole crate of my, my, my workbooks and my CDs. And, and so when we started back up in 2017, I literally pulled out some of my old education materials, started listening to them in the car and just making sure that I could evaluate a deal properly and that sort of thing. And then what we also did is because I really didn't have time because I started working again. So I I spent nine years at a a local um, healthcare system company in their corporate office uh, between 2010 and 2019 when I finally quit. Um, So we were doing this part time and my wife was really helping kind of augment the business. And um, but we partnered up um, because we didn't have time to go find the deal. Um, and beat the streets and do the marketing and that sort of thing. We started relying on some of our local um, investor-friendly brokerages that help you know people buy off-market deals or auction deals. And so we partnered up with one of them locally, and they brought us a deal in West Seattle. Um, we looked at several first, but this one just made sense. And when I saw it and we saw the margin and the amount of work, it just seemed like, I think we can do this. Um, and so we kind of took a big risk and jumped in. I was honestly very scared because you know, I had going bankrupt as a father and a husband, it's really, you feel like you've done it to your family. And so I just had a lot of fear. I just did not want to put my family through that again, but I had a good job at the time. And so I felt confident that, Hey, we got a steady paycheck. That's cool. And if you can, you know, talking to my wife, if you can help kind of, you know, work some of the, the, the project itself, then between the two of us, I think we can make this happen. And then plus the brokerage we bought the property from, they kind of coached us through it too. So it was just with all these things, we said, oh, you know what, we, we finally got enough capital to kind of give this a shot. And we went for it, you know, did the hard money thing, got the property, hired a contractor, went through the whole project and, and it worked out really well for us on that first deal. Wow. That is, that is a super story. Go ahead, me. What were you going to say? No, I mean, that, that's, and I'm trying, I'm just trying to imagine your loss and, and having to pull your family through it. How many properties did you have, you know, before the crash that you had to basically let go of? Um, we owned, 
two rentals by ourselves, uh, one in uh, Las Vegas and one in Georgia. Um, and then we own six condos with my dad in partnership in Colorado. Um, and then we had this, uh, built, you know, this development project in Tequila where we had one house built and we were still trying to split the land and, and build one, at least one more. Um, and, and so we lost all, all of that. Wow. That is crazy. Did that project in Tequila ever get built? No, I've driven by it recently. It's still just the one house, honestly. Wow. Um, yeah. We kind of did it all backwards, right? We built while we were doing a short plat. I mean, you know, and then we found out that it was going to cost like $14,000 just to put in a water retention system. And we were only going to be able to get one house instead of three on the lot. So just, you know, we were already building a house, so we couldn't, you know, stop. <laughs> it was just, yeah, again, lessons learned. It was tough. It sounds like uh, a ba- everything was backwards, right? I mean, as far as how you got started or, you know, you know, analysis on the deals, how important that is in the beginning, right? Yeah. So, um, wow. So out of all those, out of all that stuff that happened to you there, that is a great story that maybe some people can relate to that are listening here. What do you think the biggest lesson was for you out of that? Yeah. You know, honestly, what really stands out to me is by the time we bought the first rental and that was the first property we bought. So we didn't do wholesaling. We didn't, you know, we just, we out of the gate, put a down payment down on a property and bought it. We were in such a hurry to take action and so frustrated that a lot of the local deals that we had looked at didn't pencil. Um, Cause again, it was a hot market. We were right at the top of the 2005 market and we're like, we're ready to buy. And my wife and I were just getting so impatient that we ended up buying a deal that was very top of the market deal. There was no equity in it. Honestly, they were speculating with us and saying, Hey, you know, this market's going to keep going up. It's a development that is going to be building million dollar homes. And you can get this one for like, I think it was, 200 something. I can't even remember. It was a gorgeous house. DR Horton, 3,500 square feet, nicer than anything we've ever lived in, <laughs> but, you know, in Georgia. Um, but we bought it basically at full retail because we were just so impatient. And that's the lesson that we really learned is be patient, stick to your numbers, buy with equity, do not rush. It's better to have to wait a long time and then get a good deal than to rush into something that you regret later. Awesome. That is absolutely great advice. I think it's funny because even sometimes at our weekly meetings, you know, people will come and you can tell that I I think recently we had somebody come that was looking at a deal. And I think collectively, which is so great to why we have the SIC weekly media, we probably had at least 15 people turn to this person and say, don't do it. (laughs) Were you guys there at that one? I think I missed that one, Last week, but, I, but the week you weren't there, the same thing happened. Um, yeah. So. yeah. So boy, if you guys ever uh, come across a deal and you're not sure if you should do it or not, definitely show up to our weekly uh, meetup. Uh, we have a few locations now, but Burien is the one that we do on Tuesdays from 12 to two. And uh, you'll have a collective group there that you can run it by. And we'll tell you whether it's a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, at least from the information that you tell us. It's always nice to have a community that you can run stuff by. And uh, we're happy to talk things through with all of you guys. Um, So, wow. So now we're back to Seattle and you've kicked it off again here, starting to do some flips. Um, I think you said you got your first deal through, what was it, Heat and Daynard or somebody like that? Yes, Heat and Daynard, um, West Seattle. Great turnaround neighborhood. Um, it just had everything going for it. Um, pretty cosmetic. Uh, you know, I think we took out a kitchen wall and moved a water heater. The rest was just making it beautiful. Um, so pretty simple, straightforward, which was great, right? It was just nice to have one that was pretty straightforward. Um, contractor nailed it to the week in terms of schedule. Uh, I think we had $2,000 in overages on a $50,000 fix up, which I just thought was phenomenal. Um, and, oh, wow. yeah, and I think we came out with about a $35,000 profit on that one. Nice. Yeah. So how, had, I'm curious though, how, how did you, how did you find your contractor for that first deal? So we used a local hard money lender. Um, 
you know, 12% with two points up front. So two percentage points we had to pay just to close the loan or get the loan. Um, and we put uh, 20%, no, 25% down on the entire project. So they added the cost of acquisition, which was about 400 and our fix up budget, which was 50. And then they, um, we paid uh, 25% down on that entire amount. Um, and then they funded, you know, the rest. Nice. And, and, and well, when it comes to the contractor, how did you, how did you find the contractor? How did you know how to put it under, you know, what kind of contract to put it in between you guys? Okay. Yeah. Great question. So we asked, um, uh, uh, the, the broker actually that, um, sold us the deal. So Heaton Daner, we, we asked if they had any recommendations and they were a little tentative to give us recommendations because, you know, nobody wants to, you know, everybody hopes for the best, but if you have a bad experience, which we did on one of our later deals, um, you know, they don't want to be blamed. Right. So, but I said, Hey, look, you know, I just need recommendations. Just I'll, I'll do the reference checks and, and that sort of thing. So they gave us a couple names. Um, we called them this one guy, uh, just happened to open up a window of availability. He was finishing up another project and I got some pictures and, and got references from him. And, um, you know, basically just on those recommendations, uh, we gave him a shot. And then I asked Heaton Daner to, you know, do you have any contracts I can use with this guy and, and that sort of thing. And so they gave me a template. I went through it. I read every line of it and just tweaked it a little bit so that I felt comfortable with it. And then um, basically he and I signed that contract with kind of his scope of work as, a, an, as an addendum to that. And is that the contract that you use to this day? Yes. Awesome. Cause I did make a mistake later on letting a contract or make me sign his contract, which had no recourse for me whatsoever. Um, and the only reason I did it is because it was a recommendation that I'd got. He'd came highly recommended. We'd actually tried to use him on previous projects, but he was always busy. And then he opened up on this one project and I thought, well, you know, we talked with him and um, just sounded great. And, you know, anyway, that, that was a nightmare, but when we get to that deal, I'll tell you about that one. Um, well, awesome. Well, let's jump into it. So we're going to, we are going to your pre Seattle deals. We'll chalk up to, Oh shit. That sucks. <laughs> How about that? Yeah. Good lessons <laughs> learned though. I mean, we still learned a lot, but yeah, it, it, it took us out. Right. And I, I think what I heard is, you know, is, is you guys don't be in a rush to get started and do your due diligence, you know, don't, don't necessarily, you know, be in such a rush to get started um, or you could hurt yourself very badly. Um, and don't do, you know, just because, you know, like I said, development is a different animal too, right? Yep. As far as jumping into that and, and, uh, you know, everybody should focus on one thing when they get started and better yet. I always, like I say, I think people should be partnering up with more experienced people on their first few deals so they don't get the hammer dropped on them hundred percent on their own or less likely to have that happen. And, you know, it's continuing education, but that's, that's just my two cents there. So let's get to the good stuff here. So your first deal, the West Seattle deal that you got essentially from a wholesaler or a broker, which is Heaton Daynard, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people have had great experiences with Heaton Daynard. Um, you know, some people have had better than others and we don't have an opinion about that. They're a great source for resource for deals. Um, and just remember that you guys all are responsible for the due diligence on your own deal. No matter even if I was giving it to you and he was giving it to you or Aaron's giving it to you or, you know, the, most uh, the busiest wholesalers in town are giving it to you. You need to 100% be responsible for understanding what's going on, what the numbers look like. Um, and if they're providing contractors to you, I would be requesting that you get, you know, references from people that have used that contractor before more than one, right? A few and recent, right? Not like a year ago um, just to protect yourself. Right. So, West Seattle, um, you had a good experience there or was there any bumps that you can share with us? And did you end up making money on that deal as much as you thought you were going to make or more? Or did you get the write up and the, as the market was taking its uptick that, that helped you or added a bunch of gravy on top? <laughs> um, 
you know, pretty much it, w- it was pretty smooth. Uh, the one thing is, is, you know, our contractor had done some of his own flips as well. And so he had some opinions on stuff. Some of them were okay, but some of them, you know, just in our gut, we were like, no, that's, that's not going to work. And, and especially when I, if I listened to my wife and I, if I was wise about listening to my wife, she would bring a different perspective that I just two guys talking together don't think of like, never putting a laundry right next to a bedroom where your kids are going to be sleeping. Cause you, you know, you can't do laundry at night if you're, if your kids are sleeping there. Right. And like, we wouldn't have thought about that. It just seemed like a great place to put it. And so, you know, so the, the, the big, the only real lesson out of that one in terms of things, you know, that we had, that were challenges is just, you know, making sure we were making the final decisions with our contractor. You know, it's not his decision. It's not his money great ideas. He's an advisor, but ultimately you make the decisions and, and you got to live or die by those decisions. So go with your gut on that stuff. Was this the, the guy, was this the guy that you used his contract? No, no, this guy, we used our own contract and we're still using him today. He is a great guy and he has bailed us out of future projects, you know, the not future project, but the like deal two and three that we might talk about. You know, he, he has really become a partner with us, but it's just learning how to work with somebody like that and making sure, you know, you are still the owner of the property. You have to decide what it's going to look like. Use your broker, you know, that's going to sell it for you to, to get ideas of what's selling and just, you know, make sure you're making the decisions. That's and then right. yes, it was profitable. Um, we had gone in thinking, you know, hoping we'd make about 25 um, thousand and the market was was really good, so we got a, a an offer uh, for ten thousand over asking, and so we made just about thirty five. I'm sure if I go back and like looked at every small receipt, it might be a little bit less than that, but it was right around the thirty five thousand mark. So for us, it was definitely a double right out of the gate, right? And and so that was pretty exciting. Built our confidence. Then we bought the next house, <laughs> and, and we we got a beating. <laughs> Did you um did you meet your timelines for this one? I mean, you know, obviously hard money, local hard money is pretty yeah. short term. Um, yeah. Have you done do any extensions or everything? No, goes- that first project we had a, a, a oh gosh, I can't remember. Th- I think three months was our construction estimate time, and I think we nailed that, and then s- we closed within four total months. So, um, you know, it was sold and done in in just about four months on that one. So met our timelines that, like I said, the first one just really went very smoothly. Okay. Wow. Yeah. That's, hey, that's like let me ask, first let me ask you a question. Nee. So as far as um, like uh, one thing that knee is very awesome at pointing out to you guys um, is that you need to be careful with, especially now. I mean, yeah. And you know, a year or two ago we were, you could get in and out and you know, even four months sometimes, right? But uh, the way the loans were structured, it, it almost set you up to have to hit your extensions. T- say something about me on, on loan terms and what everybody needs to be watching out for, especially these days with longer days on market. Yeah, I mean, I always think everyone should get a one-year loan if possible, right? I mean, I, I do that now, even if I have a two-week flip. There's just so many things out of your control when it comes to flips. Um, you know, we had... Like one example was I had a homeless encampment moving across the street from my one of my flips and that made it sit for a while. And so, you know, whenever as much control as you think, and I think a lot of flippers are pretty optimistic. Um, and it's just, and you, you don't really get hit until again, the market either flattens or turns. And now suddenly, you know, two weeks on the market suddenly scares people and they start running around and, and crying and going crazy. So, you know, <laughs> having that, having that one year term really sets, you know, gives you peace of mind. Uh, and it really gives you time to figure things out because when some things like that go wrong, it's even worse when you have to start worrying about extensions and paying more fees. And at, and at the end of it, I mean, extensions, you know, the last, if you have a six month note and you took you eight or nine months to actually complete it, the the last two or three months are actually probably cost as much as the first six months. Right. Are, is it common for uh, hard money lenders to offer a year or does everybody offer it for higher I don't know, or is it, you know, that you guys have are thoughtful and recognize the needs of, uh, you know, investors and have made that product available? 
I think, I mean, majority of local lenders are more about five or six months and you can get longer terms, but you just generally have to pay more points for it. Um, there are other lenders coming in, more, more national, regional type lenders who are, offer a standard one-year term. Um, and so you just kind of have to pick which one, you know, fits better. There's obviously much more to a, a loan than just the, how long it is. But, you know, I, I would say just overall be conservative in everything. Um, you know, if you think you're going to hold it for six months, add another 50% to it. So at least nine months. Um, and then if, at least, and if you don't, then at least plan for those costs, you know, you figure out what the extension is going to cost you. And if it still makes sense to do the deal with those, with those extra numbers. Good tips guys. All good stuff. All right. Let's keep rolling here. (laughs) Yeah. So we just finished up your first one. Now let's start rolling into your second one. And did you do anything different you know, as you were approaching your second deal from just your lessons from the first deal? Yeah, we did. Well, again, part of it is, you know, we had a good experience. So now, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling a little bit more confident, right? And, and we wanted to make sure, you know, we had a long-term view of this. So we're thinking, you know, there's a lot of these good companies in the area. So we've bought one from Heaton Daynard. That went well. Let's try our experience with one of the other big companies. So we went to Caliber and we started going to their meetings, um, Caliber Real Estate. And um, we thought, you know, uh, we keep hearing about these auctions and, you know, we haven't tried that yet. Let's, let's try buying at auction. And, and again, part of it was just to, to try the process um, and learn that experience, but also to build another relationship so that we could get more sources of deals coming to us. And so um, after going to many of these weekly auction meetings, um, we finally found uh, a few properties we wanted to bid on and uh, went ahead and, and had them bid on our behalf at the auction and, uh, you know, it was a pretty fun process. You're getting these phone calls and they're like, okay, we're at this amount. And, oh, I think you got it for this price. Hold it. Oh, wait. And the guy gets interrupted while he's talking to me on the phone and he gets outbid by the person across the way from him. And he's like, oh, shoot. And he's like, you know, do you want to go to this price? And, you know, one thing that at least I, I will say for us, we, we had a number that was our max and we were just going to stick with it. And if they outbid us, we were done with it. Because, um, we, again, we didn't want to get caught up in the hype. We really just wanted to get a deal. And when we had reviewed the property the night before with Caliber at their weekly meeting, it really looked like, you know, the outside looked pretty good. Unfortunately, this one particular property, they had not had the chance to go inside because it was still occupied. Um, But, you know, there was some garbage and some cars outside, but we thought, you know, overall, it looks like it's in pretty decent shape and, um, you know, so it should be a pretty cosmetic flip. We had about a, a similar $50,000 budget as our first job. And they said, you know, we've done a bunch of these. It was a California split, you know, where you enter in and you have to go upstairs for the main living area, downstairs for a daylight basement. And, you know, they said, we've done a bunch of these, 50000 we should be able to get in and out of there. And we're like, cool, well, these guys got a ton of experience. So that's great. <laughs> Just curious, would they, if you would have, you had a hard stop number, do you feel that, um, you know, with the auctioneers there, are they looking out for you in regards to, yeah, don't pay higher than this? Or are they like, do you want to pay more? You know, it's like the hype of the moment, like you're at the yeah. casino. You, you know, know, honestly, I felt like these guys were, you know, they applaud you if you stick with your numbers, but they're very willing to take your bids higher because they make money whether you lose or not. But on the other hand, a lot of these companies are looking out for their own reputations. So they really don't want you to get a bad deal. Right. And it's not their risk. It's ours. So, you know, so there's kind of that balance point. And honestly, you know, they're like, oh, good for you. Yeah, stick with your numbers, stick with you. But I think they're kind of hoping they can win the bid because then they make their auction fee, which is almost the same as a 3% buying commission. Right. So you guys need to set those rules for yourself and stick to them, right? Exactly. Exactly. But so anyway, so we, we did win the bid. It kind of hit our, our top number. Um, you know, looking back, we kind of wish we had gotten out bid, but that's okay. <laughs> this one was chock full of amazing lessons. Um, so we ended up with this property and um, find out that the, the owners are not leaving yet. And so the, folks that uh, the, you know, caliber goes over there and they, they talk to the guy and he's like, yeah, I need a couple of weeks. And um, you know, so they, they still hadn't seen the inside yet and they were trying to get this guy out and they're trying to help us. I think they eventually did, you know, a strategy of, of cash for keys just to, to get him to move on quickly. 
Um, and was the cash for keys in your original budget numbers? No, no. Yeah. So, um, and so I think it was like, I don't know if it was like 1300 bucks or I actually, I can't remember how it ended up, but it, it took them longer to get out. So we were sitting on this property, right? We'd already gotten hard money in place and we, we wanted to use a different hard money lender as well. Um, so that we could, um, just get experience again with some of the other players in town. And so we went with rain city capital on that one. And, um, you know, so we're sitting on this property and, you know, clicking off almost a whole month without even having gotten inside yet. And, um, you know, that, that interest starts accruing. So the, the big surprise for us on this one is when we finally, got access to the place. I was so excited. So I think I took off at lunch for my job, drove over there and got, you know, and the key was in a box for me. And there was still like a car out front, tons more garbage than I remember out front. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, we'll, we'll get in there and I'm walking up to the front door. And again, the front didn't look terrible. It looked very dated, but it didn't look terrible. And then I opened the front door and I started walking in and I almost <laughs> threw up. <laughs> um, this house almost threw up because it stunk or because you realized that your budget was just blown the moment you stepped inside both, both. <laughs> so I start walking up the stairs right because remember it's a split so you kind of come into a landing and I had to go up about eight or nine stairs and as my eyes are cresting over the floor level I'm just seeing garbage piled up everywhere I'm seeing even in the fireplace was just full of garbage. And then there's just garbage out in bags and out of bags, just piled up like knee high everywhere. I started walking into the bedrooms and I, I had to wade through stuff just to get into the bedrooms and realize that they had like torn out some walls. And so there's really, instead of a three bedroom that we thought it was, um, three bedroom, one bath that we were going to convert into a four bedroom, two bath, there was only two bedrooms because they had already ripped out a wall and made this one big bedroom. Um, the bathroom was tiny. Again, everything just full of garbage and, and the toilets, there was a toilet downstairs in the basement and there's a toilet upstairs. They were both piled up and over with crap, literally. <laughs> so what we found out is that this was a drug house and the people I'm guessing they hadn't been with water garbage service or electrical power for almost two years. Um, they had cut out all the copper piping to sell and they had rerouted some of the electrical for marijuana grow lamps. And we found out that they actually had been shut off by the power company, but they had hijacked power. So they had a line running to the pole, you know, a total bootleg line running to the pole. And there was actually a lockout tag on the, the, the electrical service. And all, you know, so the plumbing's missing, electrical just completely hosed and it's just full of garbage. The backyard was so full of garbage that um, you, you could barely even walk around. And it was so deep in the topsoil that it took us forever to try to clean that out. And oh, and there was a hot tub. I'm curious though, let me ask you. So <laughs> nobody drove by or like, what are the lessons there? It feels like some of this stuff would have been a heads up with a, with a drive by or a detailed an actual, not, you know, like a, a drive by or somehow that you're watching what's going on there or looking, you could see something would be a tip off that there's, you know, I don't know. What, what are some lessons that you think you could have, uh, do you think you could have figured something out by being a little more diligent, you know, before you bought it, even if you couldn't get in or my other question for you guys is, if you own the house, can't you just give them 48 hours notice and say, we're coming in? Um, you know, I can't remember exactly how that works for the auction purchases. Um, so that's a good question. Maybe somebody I, I don't know myself. Do you know me? I, I don't have a clear idea, but I know it's never as easy as we think. <laughs> yeah. I think exactly. they told me that he has at least two weeks. I think that's like by law, they've got two weeks. That's the only thing I remember. Might be. You guys make a comment in below on the podcast uh, notes uh, if you can and tell us what you think the answer is because I'm not an expert at buying at the auction myself, but wow. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, definitely many of the houses that are vacant, they go and they look in the windows, they find a way in and they have a much more detailed understanding of what they're bringing to their clients at these meetings, you know, where they 
you know, want to help you buy at auction. This particular one, because it was occupied, they really didn't go looking in windows and that sort of thing. So they were kind of going based off what they'd see on the outside. So one of the things I would say is that, you know, as an investor, don't buy houses people haven't looked inside or go look yourself, right? And I honestly just didn't have the time. So I was really relying on these people's experience to help us make that decision. And, you know, again, lesson learned. They were totally surprised as well. They were like, oh my gosh, we've done so many of these and we've never seen one like this. Um, so that's where we were. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they even had a hot tub out back and it was full of uh, growing soil. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun to get rid of too. But, uh, but the real thing for us with us is at that point, my, you know, my wife and I were looking at our, you know, at this and, and just our heart sank and we're thinking, what do we do? Do we just walk away from this deal or, or what? And so we, we kind of worked with caliber to kind of understand what our options are. And they were really, really good. I mean, we sat in a meeting with the two owners and they just sat in a meeting with us and they, you know, they just said, you know, here's kind of, your options, right? You could tie wholesaling it, but there just wasn't enough margin to wholesale it to anybody else, right? That could handle a much heavier flip than, than we thought we could handle. Um, or, Do you think though, you would lose less money if maybe you would have uh, trashed out the house or something and then tried to wholesale it? You know what I mean? Like, do you think if you would have stepped out at that moment that you would lose less money than you ultimately ended up losing? Even well, I mean, at the end of the at the end of the day we did make a little bit of money on this one um oh. it turns out um but that was purely because the market bailed us out at the last moment but the but that's exactly what they were coaching us they said look don't even bring a contractor in there until you trash the place out meaning you know clear it out and so we tried a couple different things we tried the 1-800 junk you know guys and and i don't recommend that because it's 800 dollars for a very small truck um but we did that first, barely made a dent in it. Um, we then hired, I basically went out and rented a 26 foot U-Haul and three guys from Home Depot and did three dump runs filling that 26 foot tra- uh, truck up to the rim, um, three dump loads and a whole day's labor and at least got it like to the point where we could walk around and clean out. I mean, the garage was full up to our chest. We found five couches in that pile of <laughs> garbage that was in um, the the garage in the basement, you know, and, and tons of rats and all sorts of fun. I think we threw away, I don't know, 25 tires. And, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, just it just kept coming and coming, coming. But that's, that's kind of a good tip is that um, when you have a re- heavily trashed out house, um, hire, uh, go rent a truck and hire some guys from Home Depot and just keep working until it's done because it'll be cheaper than kind of the professional guys that come and do demo and, and, and clean out. Cause, um, we spent maybe, I was just did the numbers the other day. I think it was under, under $2,000 to, to just get garbage out of there. Um, and so then, what does that mean? You went down to home Depot and went to the guys where they're hanging out and yep. picked them up and drove them back. Yep. I basically said, Hey, um, this is the job I've got. Um, I need three guys. What do you charge? It was about 20 bucks an hour. And, I went and rented a big truck and then picked them up and we just worked for, you know, the whole day and did three dump runs, um, getting that, that garbage out of there. Um, so now what happens now it's cleaned out. What'd you do? So then I started bringing contractors in. Um, and again, I didn't have a longstanding relationship with the first contractor, but it, you know, he had done a good job for us. Um, we wanted again to build our quiver of contractors. So we, we asked for recommendations from caliber. They gave us about four names we started calling people, having them come out, and they were just giving us these huge estimates, right? So, you know, we went in thinking 50 was what we had budgeted for, and we're getting numbers back like, you know, 100, 90, you know, 120, and we're just thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what are we going to do? And so I called the guy that had done our West Seattle project, and we had recommended him to someone else too, so he kind of felt like he owed us a favor. Um, and he came over and looked at it and I said, look, if you could keep us to about 80, we might break even (laughs) on this project. And he said, yeah, I don't know if I can do it. He says, but I'll just do whatever I can. He says, if you just let me make trade-offs in the moment that I know I can save you money here and there, um, you know, I'll just, I'm just going to keep working at it, but I'll shoot for the 80, but I can't promise you that. But I just, you know, what I will do is just try to keep it as tight as I can. 
And we said, okay, Ken, you know, just whatever you can do, that would be awesome. And then he just went to work. Now, meanwhile, we're in about two months now um, and we still haven't started work, right? Um, the power company, you know, we didn't have power. And that was one of the things he coached us on too. He said, look, you've got to get the power restored. Um, and I've got a guy that can do the panel. We'll get it, you know, get the permits. We'll do all that stuff, get a new service mast and, and, and meter and all that stuff. And so that took a few weeks to get done. And then like, once we had that, you know, then we had to like call the water company and we had to convince them that we weren't the old owners. Right. Cause they were like, we are never selling water to this house again until it's truly sold. And we had to like show them all this proof of, of sale. And just before they would take off the, you know, the, the kind of the, the blacklisted, uh, thing in their system for water. Um, so, you know, we're learning a lot of these processes as we go. And so about two months in, I think ish, uh, we finally were like able to start. So, you know, now we're starting at ground zero and my wife and I are kind of looking at the hard money and thinking, man, I don't know if we can do this. Um, and, and also there's the draw, the draw, uh, process was just a lot more complicated than the first hard money lender I'd used. And, and so we ended up, uh, my mom actually passed away early that year and we had inherited some money and we thought, well, maybe we should close out this hard money so that we can just buy ourselves time. Cause I think this project's going to take us a lot longer than our original thought. And so we, we were able to pull enough capital together and we got a HELOC on our house and we closed out the hard money loan just so that we drastically reduced our um, holding costs. Um, so we could buy ourselves more time to just try to break even. And that's kind of what we were moving towards. Is wow. Breaking even at this point. Yeah. Me, is there anything else that you can think of that at that point from a hard money or loan perspective that he could have attempted to do or. No, I mean, I know you said it pretty quickly too that. Oh, I just got a HELOC on my house, but obviously you can, you couldn't have done that without some kind of, you know, salary income, either you or your wife. Right. Right. And, <clears throat> and so you, you got lucky with, you know, with some money coming in and, and you also were able to do an actual conventional type loan to also get additional money to pay off the hard money. I mean, I, I don't know if you planned it out, but you know, like this is, this is why we tell people not to quit your jobs because then you, when you're in these tough situations, it's much harder to get out. Right. Right. And, and again, it, that's not necessarily like an exactly repeatable process for anybody listening, but the point is, is, you know, my wife and I were talking about it and, and the decision we made is we have got to do something. You know, we've just got to figure something out to, to, to just make sure the holding costs don't bleed us into a really even more negative situation. Um, we had some great neighbors too. So, you know, once people saw what we were doing and of course they knew this neighbor because drug guys were coming in and out constantly, you know, they were just coming over and, and being really helpful. One real tip I can give people how to get rid of a car that probably doesn't have title and is sitting in a driveway. <laughs> well, my neighbor who was a cop um, over at the house said, Hey, you know, one trick is just back the car out into the street. And once it's blocking your driveway, call the police and have them come tow it away because it's an obstruction. And I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I did that. Luckily we had an uphill driveway and we had gravity to help us. And we, we rolled it right onto the street and I, I jetted back to work, <laughs> called the police and it was gone by morning. So, wow. Uh, wow. so that's a good tip just for that anybody. That is a good tip. Uh, yeah. There you go. That might be the number one tip of the day guys right there. Yeah. Who knows? Can you do it with good. boats too? <laughs> yeah. Motorhome, all boats, that. But yeah. But anyway, another real important lesson was the moment back to the discussion we were having with the caliber guys, you know, it's kind of, they were giving us these options, you know, get the garbage out. Oh, and protect the structure. They said, whatever you do, get on that roof and just get the crap off the roof so that it, you know, it's protected. Um, and just make sure that this, you know, just while you're deciding, just make sure the shell is protected as best you can. And so that, you know, we kind of did that, but then it was just that moment of, you know, challenge that said, you know, you guys can, can try to wholesale it, you, you know, but the numbers may not work. You can try to, you can walk away or, you know, just know that one out of 10 deals kind of go sour and you're getting yours up front. You know, we've had terrible deals where we've lost 50,000 or blah, blah, blah. You guys with but, me? You know, there just comes a point where you get, you know, you just got to decide, are you just going to put your heads down and, and kind of hope for the best? And, and we just kind of said, you know what, regardless what happens, we're going to learn a ton if we follow through with this. And it's, it might be an expensive educational project or we might get lucky and break even, but you know what? 
we decided to go for it. And from that moment, we just kind of put our heads down and we just said, okay, what's next? Step one, garbage out, do this, do that. Next step, get the power and get the water on. Okay, next step. And we just, we just kept kind of putting our head down and saying, what's the next step? What's the next step? And we just did it, it just kind of trusting the process. Um, and, and honestly, there was a lot, I mean, everything that could go wrong went wrong. We had, we had drug people coming back to the house. They were climbing over the fences, um, you know, all that stuff. And we eventually had to put like little plastic spikes atop the fences to try to keep them out. We bought ring cameras for the entire property just to alert us. And, 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 um, uh, and where was this house? This was in a kind of a lower end neighborhood in Auburn, kind of the border between Auburn and federal way. Um, kind of one of the older little pocket neighborhoods that's over there. Um, and, and it was one of the bigger houses in that neighborhood. Um, but you know, we were just, we just didn't have much hope for the neighborhood. Uh, but we just pressed on and pressed on. And I'll tell you, it started coming together and we started making some good decisions. And my wife and, and our kids, we went over there and spent a ton of time trying to, you know, save some money by doing some of the landscaping, cleaning the windows. I mean, they had like painted out windows that we didn't even, they were already vinyl. We didn't want to replace them with our budget. So we were like scraping for hours and using gunk removal. And I mean, just anything we could to save some of these, these features. Um, but I'll tell you, I know we're, you know, we're kind of going a little long on time here, but when we finally got the place staged and you remember that first time I walked in the house and I wanted to throw up almost this time I literally came and, you know, we had had the outside painted now roof replaced couple, you know, we, we didn't replace any of the windows actually, cause they were all newer windows. I walked into the house and I walked up those stairs and I almost cried this time because the stager had made this place look so incredible. It was like something out of an HGTV show. And, you know, it was just really one of those moments where I felt like, oh, this is worth it, you know? Um, oh, and one other thing too is uh, when you're making spending trade-offs, sorry, backing up a little bit um, for another lesson learned. When you're making spending trade-offs, you know, it's really important, especially when you're behind the eight ball like that, is to just make sure that every dollar you spend has a, a good potential for a return on that investment. So, you know, if you're going to spend, you know, a couple thousand bucks on some feature, you know, you want it to come back more than that, right? You want the sales price to go up more than that. And one of the features that my wife and I didn't agree on was a back deck. So basically because they had trashed the backyard so much, there was this kind of sunken patio, you know, you kind of come out of the dining room and you go down the stairs to this slab and just the walls looked terrible. The slab, I just couldn't see how to make it nicer. And one of the things the guy from Caliber said is he said, you know, if this had a deck, I think you could really, you know, the emotional appeal would be so much higher that you might get a better you know, sale price for it. So I talked to my contractor. I said, how much would it take to put this deck on here? And he's like, I think it'd be about five grand. And I'm like, oh, man. But I kept talking to, to Zach over at Caliber. And he's like, yeah, I, I really think you need it. Um, just to, to make this happen. But my wife was like, no, we don't want to spend that money. We, they, we shouldn't spend that money. The house looks great. And I, I was just torn, but I could, but all of a sudden I could envision the deck and what it would look like for an entertainment area. And I was like, we got to do this. And so we just kind of took the risk. We spent the money. And honestly, like I said, that first time when I came up and it was all staged, we had the deck staged as well. It was just phenomenal. And um, we ended up getting um, an offer that was 25000 over our break-even price on the property. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it was just amazing. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, it worked out well. Oh, and then Caliber did another really, really classy thing for us. They said, look, we know this is not what we were expecting, and we don't want you guys to be put out of the game on this. They said, we're going to reduce our sale fee. So their list back fee to just a thousand bucks instead of the full 3%. They said, look, we, we want you to make some money on this because we want you back as a customer and we're just going to do that for you. And we're just like, Oh wow. And that was back in the beginning, you know, again, so it was just really um, one of those phenomenal things. And when Zach came back and told me like the offers he was getting, he's like, guess how much, guess how much, <laughs> you know, and he, he was so excited that, um, you know, we'd gotten an offer over asking, but honestly, it's nothing we could have done because the market for some reason, that neighborhood 
two weeks before we went to list, somebody, they just started buying in that neighborhood. It was the weirdest thing. And so prices just started driving up two weeks before we went to list. So again, total luck, but you know, we did put our heads down. We trusted the process. We went for it. We figured at the end of the day, if we lose some money, we've learned a ton that will carry us forward in our business. It took us probably eight months to, to finish the project. Um, and I just actually did the bookkeeping just recently on that project. And so I think we netted somewhere around 12,000 profit total. I think I, I thought it was a little more, but now that I've done the books on it, it was about 12,000. So after all that, we did come out a little bit ahead and we learned a ton. And you kept on going. Well, I'm glad to hear that you had a good experience with Caliber. Um, just as a side note, you guys, Caliber is our preferred vendor for auction properties. If you guys are looking to get more information about um, how to participate at the auction. Uh, I don't know if the auction, I don't know if there's as many properties today at the auction. I think it's slowed down tremendously from back in the day, but maybe might be picking back up. It's worth checking in. If you're looking for another source of leads, um, you know, uh, go check out Caliber Real Estate for those guys. I'm glad they treated you well. That's very nice to hear. So the big, the big lesson learned, I mean, I, I myself, so and <laughs> like, I, I'm thinking like, I absolutely, I don't know, Nee, how you're, what you're hearing, but I feel like it doesn't sound almost like anybody went to look at the proper, uh, property beforehand. It just seems like something could have been done um, to sleuth out this problem a little bit ahead of time. Um, maybe not the piles of trash on the inside, but I think even just a good time, good old exterior look would have been a red flag on something, but what, so your biggest lessons learned, and then we'll move on to your last deal before we wrap up. We'll do a quick touch on your last deal because you are continuing. We said you're on your fifth and sixth deal right now. Yep. So you're, you're feeling good about something. Yeah. Um, so take away from this one would be what, and what did you change going into your third deal? Um, well, we didn't buy an auction anymore. Um, mainly because the auction market was really dying out. And even Caliber has switched a lot of their strategy on that. And they're going way more off market, finding off market deals. Same with. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, seeing the inside of a house, it's just really important. And it's, and you know, it's a gamble if, if you don't, you really need to know what you're getting into. Otherwise you're gambling. And you know, our gamble paid off, but I mean, in eight months we could have done two other projects and made more money. Um, you know, so for an eight project and, and eking out $12,000 in profit, um, that's, you know, it's, it's great that we made some money, but it, you know, that's not a great deal. You know, that's just, it's, it's a great lesson learned. Um, and we got lucky, uh, the market shifted, we were able to close out the hard money. I mean, it's so, you know what I'm saying? It's like, if, if all that hadn't come together, we'd be sitting on a, you know, multiple $10,000 loss. Um, on that one. So after these experiences and you've continued to move on, what after even that experience made you go, you know what, I'm going to keep going. What, what, what was it that just you committed to being a real estate investor and you enjoy it or, you know, it's not that much money to make to be like, yeah, let's keep going. Right. Well, it's because we had a long-term vision and the long-term vision was to be able to quit my job someday um, to be able to, you know, build up enough capital from flipping that we could start buying rentals again um, and building a passive income and, and really um, learn a business that I could teach my kids because I really want them to have choices in life. And that's one of the big drivers is that I've never been business minded and I've never been good at making money on any kind of venture other than a W-2 job. <laughs> Um, and it's just one of those things where I want my kids to be able to have choices. If they want to work a job because they love it, do it. Give it your all. If you're unhappy, just know there's other choices. And if I can learn a business that's easily teachable to my kids, um, then that's what's driving us. And, and I was able to quit my job on, in May of this year because we had built up enough momentum, not enough income, but enough momentum that we knew that I could do more if I wasn't spending eight to 10 hours at a job. Um, and now we've got four, actually five active projects going currently. 
And I couldn't do that if I was still working. So it's just, it just, what, got what is it that you're spending your time on uh, that is able you to get that momentum going? It's lead flow, right? So what I hear a little bit is that early on you were, you know, kind of taking action out of almost uh, wanting to get going on it. Maybe uh-huh. even, maybe even it sounds like the auction property, right? You know, um, you know, just wanting to get a deal and get going and feeling like you had some trusted advisors that kind of were going to be there to guide you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, what is it that's changed for you in your lead flow or, you know, since you quit your job um, that you feel allowed you to feel comfortable with doing that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, You know, the main thing is, is that we start networking with a lot more wholesalers. This is before we, you know, I myself am getting into wholesaling, but you know, we started mar- uh, networking with a lot more wholesalers, um, just getting out to every wholesale appointment we could. Um, my wife was an agent for about a year. Um, she just didn't find that it was a good personality fit for her, so she didn't want to do it anymore. But our third deal, um, she actually found herself. Um, and then uh, we, Caliber brought us an off camera, uh, off camera, <laughs> off a market deal. And again, we just started just putting more energy into networking with people that were bringing us deals and that created deal flow to us. Um, and now I want to source my own deals with my partner as well as being a source of deals for other folks. So it's just, you know, being able to put that focus into, um, just ramping up. And, you know, instead of just doing one deal every six months, we, we thought, well, I think we can handle two deals at a time. And, um, you know, and then once I quit, I had more time to expand that. Um, and so that's kind of kind of what we've done. Right. I think we were talking about at the SIC meetup this week, how as my, our friend Jacob Weaver and I were talking about this, how um, creating, like taking massive action not, not quick action, like where you're making a quick decision about an emotional decision just to get in the game, but in order to find the right opportunity or meet the right upper people or, you know, get connected with the right networking crowd that's going to help your business move forward um, or just lead generate in general, it requires massive action and, and not spreading yourself too thin, like focusing like a bat out of hell. How am I going to lead generate? How, cause the rest of the stuff falls into place. If you can lead generate and you can, so you can do, you have enough leads that you can do due diligence and buy the right deals. Right. Yep. Um, but, but create, you know, it is hard to do part time. Um, you know, I, I keep wondering to myself, like, what is everybody doing these days? For some reason, it feels like people are out there spinning wheels a little bit, but, um, I'm glad that you are pushing through Aaron Um, you know, and, um, you know, just to wrap it up here, um, you know, if you had to pick one thing that out of all your lessons, that was your biggest aha moment, what would that be? So we can wrap it up and let everybody go back to pushing the real estate business forward. Oh gosh. The one lesson, um, get really good advisors around you learn how to run the numbers, find people that augment your, your skill set. Um, Cause I think that's a, you know, what a lot of people that want to get into real estate, they just grasp at anything that looks interesting. And you really just have to take into account. Do I have time? Do I have money? Do I have the skill required to do what I'm trying to do? And if not figure out what you do have, what type of investing it would lend itself to. So for example, I knew I didn't have time while I was working a full job to go marketing for leads. So I was going to leverage people that were spending 10,000 bucks a month or more doing that and just take a lower margin for myself and do the thing that I did have time for, which is flipping because I had a good contractor now that I was building a relationship with. My wife was kind of helping keep the projects running and I, I could, you know, the amount of time I had lent itself to that. Um, and, and just really listen to those that are wise um, when it comes to evaluating deals uh, because I've chased so many deals that weren't deals, you know, and put so much effort in trying to land a deal that just didn't really have a chance to get off the ground. And so when I hear people saying, hey, I got this potential deal and I ask them about it, it's like, you know, uh, 99 times out of 100, that's not going to go through. So don't 
put all your eggs in that basket. If it goes through, fantastic. But you should be working on some other stuff and then have that be a bonus <laughs> if it does come through. You know, so I, I don't know if that's really my only lesson from these projects, but you know, that's just a big one that I, I try to encourage people that, that are getting new into the game. Sounds good. You know, I'm inspired. Me, I don't know. Maybe we can put our heads together on this here as we wrap up. But it almost sounds like we should, it'd be cool to create like a, almost like a questionnaire or a checklist for people to help them analyze the questions they should be asking themselves before they get into real estate investing. You know, because people come in and they spin the wrong way, this way, that way. Um, seems like there, maybe there's something out there that exists like that already, but it'd be fun actually at one of our meetups, maybe, maybe even next week or in the next month or so to like collectively as a group sit there and create almost like a, a a questionnaire that we can give to people to help them, you know, decide which is the best path of real estate investing for them, at least give them a little focus. Um, I don't know. I'm just talking off the top of my head. What do you guys think? I think that's a great idea. I mean, that's the, that should be the number one thing you do before even looking at a deal, right? Absolutely. Basically finding out your why and then gearing that towards real estate and how it can kind of match and actually move forward given your circumstance, right? I mean, if, you know, again, if someone's working full time and they want to flip a hundred houses, that's probably not going to work right away. And so, right. Yep. I'd love to help with that. That'd be, that'd be really Let's great. Let's do it guys. Let's do that. If anybody wants to join us, we do meet, um, weekly and we'll, and this coming Tuesday, we'll talk about this and, and everybody can collaborate. Maybe we'll take a month and, you know, every Tuesday we'll add to it or something like that. I think that's a great idea um, that we can all work on together and share with each other. But hey, Aaron, thank you so much for sharing that story uh, with us. I, I mean, it's just a great story, even from, you know, the beginning, how you were turned off to real estate as a kid by your life experience there. And then, you know, had an epiphany later on uh, based on realizing, you know, how much money can be made in real estate and then pushing through the hard times. Um, Everybody goes through tough times guys. So it's part of the package. It's part, it's to be expected. Um, And the most important thing you can do is um, get a group of peers together that are supportive and helpful to you um, and help you talk through your problems. And I hope we can be that for you guys. Um, I'm here for you guys at any time. I know Aaron would be probably willing to answer questions and help people as well. And we know knee is always available. And, you know, um, if it was up to me, I'd be running all my deals by certain lending just for another opinion. Um, because, um, that's the reason why we've, asked them and agreed with them to be um, our uh, preferred lender is because they actually watch out for people um, as their first, um, you know, as their first assistance in the lending process. Um, And it's, it's just, it's a great group of people that we have here in our local community. And just as a reminder to you guys, we have our weekly small group mastermind uh, coaching meetup that we all have lunch together. This is once a week on Tuesdays from 12 PM to 2 PM at Angelo's, which is an awesome little Italian restaurant down in Burien. Um, And we hope that you can join us there. September 5th, we are kicking off our um, third location, which is going to be on the east side in Redmond at the Family Pancake House. So for all you east siders out there that can't make it to Burien, we're going to have a 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. meetup, same format, open discussion, just all helping each other, bringing deals, sharing stories about you know, no specific topic. It takes on a life of its own and it is very powerful. So I hope you can come out and join us there if you can't make it to Burien on the east side. And lastly, for you Skagit County people that are up there listening to us, um, we do have a meetup in Mount Vernon at the Calico Cupboard, which happens, I think it's the second and fourth Thursday of every month. Um, Shoot me if you're interested in that one and email at julie at clubcom so I make sure I'm saying the right thing here. Um, but we have some, uh, guests, uh, or some hosts that help me, um, host those meetings. Um, and I'll be popping in and out of those as well. So I hope again, you guys can all join us. Look for emails. If you're not on our email list, email Joe at SeattleInvestorsClub.com, uh, and he'll get you on that list so you can get notified of these meetings. They're all on meetup.com as well. Um, but other than that, me, anything else you want to add to the conversation today? And thanks again to Aaron. 
Yeah. So, I mean, just looking over all of Aaron's experiences, I, you know, what I really love is that you, you kind of lean on your fears and you re- really recognize that even though you're making money, that it's still a failure in your book, right? Because that's how you really learn from things. If you call everything success and go out there and say, hey, my first three deals, I made money off of it. Uh, you know, I think you've, you've been in, in a different state right now. Um, and the other thing too, is that you kind of gotten started way back then a decade ago and made all these mistakes. And I was so surprised when Julie mentioned, hey, we're going to bring Aaron on to this podcast because he's a new investor. I'm like, I've talked to this guy many times. He doesn't sound like a new investor, right? And so all that experience in the past and even even the, the bankruptcy, I can tell you that a lot of people look down on that, especially lenders, right? But for me, it's it's like, to me, it tells me you've, you've I mean, you're not perfect, but you have experience. You've been through pain. And I, I would, I'd rather work with someone who's been through pain than someone who's never experienced it. And so, you know, I, I just want to tell everyone that, you know, lean on your failures um, and learn from it and grow from it and don't let it, you know, keep you down. Well said. Appreciate that. Well said. So, Joe, where can everybody find the details of today's podcast? Heck yeah, guys. That was an excellent podcast. They can get to the show notes by going to seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 86. That's seattleinvestorsclub.com slash 86. And I wanted to give a shout out to Emily from Seattle who gave us a five-star review this week on the podcast. High five, Emily. Thank you so much. And uh, those of you that would like to give us a review, we would love that. You can do so on iTunes by going to seattleinvestorsclub.com slash iTunes and uh, hit subscribe while you're over there. Good stuff. Well, all right, you guys, enjoy the rest of your summer, and we hope to see you soon at one of our Seattle Investors Club events. Over and out. Thank you. It was such a privilege. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to the Seattle Investors Club podcast. If you have questions that you'd like to have answered on the show, shoot us an email at info at seattleinvestorsclub.com. Now go out, take that action, and build that real estate business. Thanks for listening.